Um, so this is our third session. Um, and again, um, we have a stellar lineup of speakers to talk on the subject of CF lung infections. So to start the proceedings, um, I'd like to introduce Professor Martin Welsh from the University of Cambridge and his pr presentation, What's on the Menu? Why Pseudomonas aeruginosa loves the CF airways. Thanks, Martin. <coughs> right. Well, thanks. I always enjoy doing these things because I think the, the CF community is a very engaging community and uh, it's always fun to talk about the work. I, I could talk for England on this kind of stuff. So, yes, the first slide. Uh, the, the, basically, I'm going to talk mostly about SRC-17. Now, the role of SRC-17 was to look at why Pseudomonas aeruginosa really likes to colonize the CF airways. What's special about the CF airways? So, uh, well, what do we know so far? What did we know before we started doing uh, this work? Well, there's a, uh, the current view of, of uh, uh, adaptation of the CF airways is, as you can see, on the two right-hand sides of the slide up ahead here, up in, up in front. In acute infection, you have a bunch of stuff that is regulated, and in chronic infection, you have a bunch of other stuff that is modulated. And I'm not going to tell you at all that that bunch of other stuff that is modulated is unimportant. Okay? It's very important. We know that already. But there's an underlying question that we need to address. So all those things that are really important that are on the right-hand side of the slide there uh, don't tell you why the Pseudomonas wants to go into the airways. Now, I have to say something else about Pseudomonas. We know it as a model organism for the study of virulence factor production. Now, those of you who have heard me talk before will know that I often come up with the statement I'm about to make, that Pseudomonas originosa is not an inherently malevolent organism. It doesn't have a brain. It's not evil. It's producing virulence factors for a reason. And it produces those virulence factors in order to get nutrient. Because that's what it's all about, folks. It's all about getting nutrients. It's a, it's a strategy that allows this organism to grow and thrive in the CF airways. So that's what this SRC is all about. And in the remaining slides, I'll talk mostly about that and also about some of the side projects that have come from it. So, as I've just said, it's all about nutrient acquisition, and at the heart of nutrient acquisition is metabolism. And at the heart of metabolism are those things that... Now, I lecture to people on metabolism all the time. That's what's one of my functions in the university. And as soon as I start showing metabolic pathways, I can see their eyes glaze over and they go to sleep. I'm not going to talk about that this time. The nearest we'll get is what you've got in front of you here. This is core central metabolism in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. <coughs> And why has it not been investigated? Well, I've just put it up there. It's because it's not as sexy as some other phenotypes, quorum sensing, virulence factor production, and so on and so forth. But I want to re-emphasize, it is at the heart of why Pseudomonas does what it does. So our SRC involved groups from all over Europe. We've got groups from Braunschweig in Germany, uh, DTU in Denmark. We also had somebody from uh, the United States. And I'm going to touch on pretty much all of their work uh, as we go through. So what the team in, or one of the teams in, in DTU in Denmark found was that mutations in pyruvate dehydrogenase are particularly prevalent in chronic pseudomonas infections. And those mutations affect the reaction that you can see up there at the top. If you cast your mind back to when you were an undergraduate, you'll recall this as being something called the link reaction that links gly glycolysis with the TCA cycle. If you have mutations in the enzyme that catalyzes that reaction, that reaction will not go over to the right-hand side. It will be stopped. And what will happen is pyruvate will accumulate. And it turns out that that accumulation of pyruvate has some unexpected consequences. Now, I'm not going to go into this in detail. I'll point you in the direction of Bjarke Pedersen's poster, which is just out there, where he goes through this in uh, 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 much more detail than I'm able to go through it. But suffice it to say, what Bjarke and colleagues found is that uh, 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 the accumulation of pyruvate turns off type 3 secretion. Now, type 3 secretion is that molecular hypodermic syringe that is used by Pseudomonas aeruginosa to intoxicate directly host cells. So it turns that down. Pyruvate turns that down. In addition, and the surprising thing that they found was that that accumulation of pyruvate also suppresses the host immune response. So what these mutations are doing in Pseudomonas is damping down uh, uh, its virulence, and they're also damping down the host immune response to it. This is very clever 
way of doing things, and not something you could have predicted a priori from a knowledge of metabolism alone. I want to briefly touch on what uh, uh, Marvin Whiteley's group did over in the University of Georgia there. So what they did, they found something very interesting, and this is a, a take-home message that's really important. They've been doing transcriptomics not only on in vitro grown Pseudomonas aeruginosa in shake flasks. So, you know, we can make up as many media as we like, artificial sputum media and so on and so forth. But what they did is they took sputum from patients and they analyzed the transcriptome of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in the sputum from patients. And that turned out to be critically important because the most highly upregulated transcript by a long, long way was this thing up at the top there, which I've labeled sick X. And you only find it upregulated in human sputum. You don't see it upregulated in in vitro growth conditions. Now, what sick X does is it encodes a small RNA, and that small RNA plays a vital role in turning on the response to the absence of oxygen. So one of the other things that happens when Pseudomonas gets into the airways is that it senses it's short of oxygen and it responds accordingly. What did I contribute towards it, or my team? Well, we, we wondered what Pseudomonas is actually eating when it's in the airways, and one of the things that is present in abundance in the airways is this stuff, DPPC. It's a surfactant. It's one of the things that stops the lung tissue from getting stuck together. It's basically a phospholipid. Like all phospholipids, it's got long fatty acyl chains coming out of the back there. And it turns out that Pseudomonas loves metabolizing fatty acids. So, it's a fatty acid lover, like me. Okay, there are around about, unlike E. coli, so E. coli, the model organism, the model microbe, E. coli contains one pathway for degrading fatty acids, just one. Pseudomonas likes fat so much, it's got no less than six different pathways, all related for metabolizing fatty acids. But there was one bit of that pathway highlighted in purple on the beta oxidation cycle up there that we had no idea about. That's this enzyme called FAD-E, a fatty acyl CoA dehydrogenase. So we first of all asked the question, well, which fatty acyl CoA dehydrogenase? Is that all of, I said there are six pathways. There are actually 20 fatty acyl CoA dehydrogenases encoded in pseudomonas. Which of those six are important? So we took the Manchester epidemic strain, did a proteomic analysis on it, growing it in long-chain fatty acids versus glucose, and we found a couple, the most highly upregulated proteins that we could find, a couple of these uh, proteins were FAD-E homologues. We knocked them out, and we found they had a dramatic phenotype on the ability of Pseudomonas aeruginosa to grow on long-chain fatty acids, and we solved the crystal structures of them both. That's the kind of thing that we do. That's our, our, our raison d'etre. And we've identified what confers specificity in each case, because one of the fatty homologues is for long-chain fatty acids, the other one is for medium-chain fatty acids. And if anybody's interested in why you've got two, come and find me afterwards. Back over in Braunschweig, one of the projects that was going on over there, uh, it was run by Suzanne Heusler's group, and Melly Gurr from Suzanne's group is over here. She's presenting a poster, so I'm only going to touch on this again. What she found, or what she showed, very cleverly by analysing over 400 different isolates of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, was that there is a, a, a tight linkage between what they eat and their virulence phenotype. Now, this is a theme that is going throughout this talk, I hope, is coming through anyway. The bottom line is, you are what you eat if you're a pseudomonas. So she found that uh, metabolism and virulence are very strongly linked features of the biology of the organism. Just in the last few minutes, we had some projects that came out of this, uh, thank you, some projects that came out of this uh, uh, SRC. One of the projects was to have a look at polymicrobial cultures to see if we could reconstitute them in vitro, and we can. Uh, it's quite difficult to do, but we can now stably maintain cultures of three species, Pseudomonas, Staph, and Candida, all present in the CF airways for very long periods of time. The bit that you'll be interested in is what happens if we throw drugs in there. This is what happens if you throw drugs on the left-hand side, five times MIC of ciprofloxacin into a monoculture, and this is in artificial sputum medium, you can see there's a dramatic decline in the titers. They then recover afterwards because this is a continuous flow medium. We're continually diluting it. If you have the polyculture on the right-hand side here, you can see you can dump in the same amount of ciprofloxacin, and it barely even feels it. So the presence of these other bugs in the airways has a dramatic impact on antibiotic resistance. We get very similar results if we throw in colistin. What happens if we throw them both in? 
Well, if we throw them both in, we get a larger effect on the Pseudomonas aeruginosa there. But the really disturbing thing, folks, is the green line. That's the Candida albicans. So treatment with both of these antibiotics causes a Pseudomonas to uh, 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 die off, but you get a response in terms of the niche that's liberated is occupied by another organism, in this case a fungus, and that's not good for you. Right, I will end there. So some ongoing work that is leading out of SRC 17, and it's really important that we keep momentum going, is we're putting in an application for Marie Curie funding at the moment by pretty much all of the groups involved, plus a few others. Uh, we're trying to understand why certain mutants that are commonly arising in the CF airways, that's LASR, MEXT, Auxotrophs are so, so strongly selected. We're also very interested in uh, what's present in the biofilm matrix. So what does the matrix trap? What kind of proteins are trapped in the biofilm matrix and how does that differentiate it from, uh, for example, the, the secretome, the regular secretome? On that point, I've had my red card, I'm closing down now. Thanks. <laughs>
He then went on to look at how that model is modulated in the context of a CF mouse. So this is using the gut corrected CF mouse. And the, the broad phenotype that we see within that allergic response is there's increased uh, T cell responses and increased neutrophilia in the CF mouse compared to the wild type animals. He went on to do proteomic analysis of, these, uh, of the airway in these animals. And he basically showed that pulmonary surfactants, complement, chitinases, and R1 uh, receptor accessory protein were all upregulated, and this seemed to link into the, um, the, the um, cytokine-based work around the R1 uh, inflammasome pathway. So we became more interested in that component. And uh, he also identified that R1 uh, RAP, which is basically downstream of all of those components from the inflammasome as well as IL-33, seemed to be an important component, and that by drugging caspase 1, caspase 11, uh, he was able to reduce the inflammation as well as the neutrophilic inflammation in that animal, and that perhaps opens up mechanisms for development of uh, immunomodulatory strategies within this SRC. Um, so neuron ABPA is characterized by upregulation of damage response pathways and increased neutrophilic and T cell responses in neuron ABPA, and targeting R1 RAP appears to reduce damage responses and neutrophilic inflammation. So then uh, moving into the uh, pathogen side of things, we had this additional funding through the Wellcome Trust. We've been doing large scale genome sequencing products, uh, sequencing uh, projects in the UK and more broadly, looking at both clinical isolates and the environment. There was actually this paper where we showed that CF patients were being affected by environmentally driven resistance strains uh, in our cohorts in the UK. And subsequent to that, we focused in on our cohorts in uh, the Brompton. So this is essentially uh, looking at 150 isolates from the Brompton, showing there are two different clades. And 80% of these are cystic fibrosis patients, and there's a lot of triazole resistance within this cohort as well. So there's rich ground for looking at lots of different aspects here. We implemented the uh, phenotypic microarray platform. There's actually a poster here on Pseudomonas, which is really nice to see. Um, to look at scale at the phenotypic characteristics we see within these genome sequence strains, and um, this was courtesy of uh, NIHR infrastructure grants. So this is basically just a schematic of that high throughput phenotyping uh, software uh, uh, platform, which I haven't got time to go into. Um, in essence, we were able to show that there was sort of clear separation of CF from non-CF strains. And this seemed to be, uh, to a large degree, dependent on pH metabolic uh, flux as shown in these uh, heat maps here and PCA analysis. Uh, when we looked at uh, chloride, it was very clear that chloride was a determinant of, of the CF lung. So those strains that have been ex exposed to CF, i.e. CF clinical strains, have got increased ability to survive in the presence of chloride, which of course is interesting given the importance of chloride in cystic fibrosis, and in a way a kind of positive control that there seems to be adaptation to the lung. We also saw that histidine seemed to be really important in terms of survival in the airway. Um, and this was, this was based on the work that was done using amino acid and carbohydrate metabolic substrates. When we looked at that uh, in more detail, we realized that actually histamine was, was phenocopying the data we see with histidine, suggesting that within the airway, where there's an allergic phenotype, the fungus might actually be adapting to that, uh, to that environment because there's lots of histamine released in allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. So when we did the sub-analysis, we basically showed that the ABPA strains in particular appeared to be having increased tolerance to histamine, which is very interesting. When we look at the, uh, the biochemistry of um, histidine metabolism and aspergillosis, histamine is actually a direct meta metabolite of histidine in eukaryotes, but the, the, the downstream enzymes seem to be missing from uh, aspergillus. Uh, so the next thing that we did was we exposed aspergillus to histamine and looked at whether or not it was metabolizing it. And based on a uh, simple measurement of histamine in supernatants, that did appear to be the case. We then went on to um, perform LCQTOF to look at the levels of histamine within those isolates. And whilst histidine was clearly present in all the isolates that we looked at, histamine did not appear to be present in uh, these aspergillus isolates, suggesting that it's not metabolizing histidine to histamine in itself. Uh, we then looked at, uh, came back to the animal model that had been developed within the SRC and looked at these histamine tolerant isolates and whether or not they could survive within the context of neuron ADPA. And in fact, as you can see on the left here, there did seem to be uh, better survival for these strains in an ADPA model, and that was correlated with um, CFUs, as you can see here. Um, however, there didn't seem to be an effect on total IgE, although we haven't looked at aspergillus IgE specifically. 
We then looked at whether or not these strains induce more cytokines, and it did appear that um, the strains overall produce more IL-1, beta, and IL-33, <coughs> as well as IL-13, suggesting that these strains are driving, these histamine intolerant strains do seem to also be driving inflammation as, as well as increase uh, murine load, as, at least within the context of the murine model. So summarizing uh, that part of the talk, ABPA clinical isolates are histamine adapted. ABPA clinical isolates have increased growth in neural ABPA and histamine adaptation is associated with high level damage and type two cytokine responses in the airway. Uh, and targeting these pathways may have utility in allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. So in terms of next steps for um, this, um, <coughs> this SRC, uh, most of our students are finishing this year, so th there's lots of downstream projects that are being written up at the moment, as well as their PhD theses. Um, there's this on-bone biobank that we've developed. We've actually got 250 samples now um, with lots of different um, aspects that are possible. So we're applying for further funding uh, to do the various multiomics that are required for that. Tom Williams, who was a PhD student, is now in, in place as a, as a postdoc to do the multiomic analyses on uh, that cohort, and the biobanking will continue. Uh, and, we, and then Yihe Kiao is setting up the, um, the fact studies in particular. He'll be focusing on getting that work done in the next year. Um, and we're applying for further industrial funding because the, the SRC itself didn't fund multiomic work. So we need, now need to go on and find somewhere to give us that money. So I finally just want to thank uh, the students and fellows who did the work. So Tom, Yihe, David, Nicola, Nic Nicole, Sarah, Elliot, and, and Alex and uh, those are their pictures down there. The patients, clinicians, and clinical research team at Brompton, uh, Manchester, and Exeter. And then the, the principal investigators, so Andy Jones and Alex Horsley in Manchester, Adelia Warris in Exeter, Stuart Elborn at Queen's, uh, Frank Bidevonk in uh, Nijmegen, and Stu Levitz in UMass Boston, uh, Pete Kelleher, uh, Anand Shah, Gerard Leroy Mamous, who's doing a metabolomic work at Imperial, and Rosemary Boyton, and then Imogen Felton in the clinical team at Brompton. So thanks very much. Thanks, thanks very much, Darius. So our final presentation before the Q&A is on exploiting bacterial quorum sensing signals to diagnose Pseudomonas aeruginosa infection in CF. So welcome Professor Martin C Miguel Camara from Nottingham University. Thank you. Right, so what I'm going to tell you is a story that I started 15 years ago, and um, we think that now it's getting closer to the clinic, so it's, it's been very, very exciting. So, um, as uh, the, the title says, we are exploiting a, a biomarker uh, of Pseudomonas aeruginosa as a way to diagnose Pseudomonas infections in CF. And as you know, Pseudomonas aeruginosa makes a, a whole battery of uh, virulence determinants uh, to be able to succeed during the infection. And uh, what we know is that Pseudomonas causes infection in many different body parts, not just in the, in the lung, like is the case of cystic fibrosis patients. So all that, those um, um, determinants of virulence, uh, you find that uh, many of them are actually controlled by a common mechanism that is uh, quorum sensing. And uh, quorum sensing is based on the, the, the use of a small uh, diffusible signal molecules. And in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, you've got um, three main quorum sensing systems, and uh, the signal molecules that uh, activate those quorum sensing systems are divided into two classes. So on the left-hand side, you've got the NSL homocytolactones, and on the right-hand side, you've got the alkylquinolones. The signal molecules are very, very important to control a lot of virulence determinants, such as the production of cytot cytotoxins, the, 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 the production, the, the movement of uh, pseudomonas from one site of infection to another, antibiotic resistance, and very importantly, also controlling the sensitivity of biofilms to antimicrobials. But these molecules, they also have a very important role in the infection that normally gets forgotten. And uh, these molecules can also affect the, the immune system, so they're very strong immunomodulators, they have very strong cardiovascular effects, so they can dilate blood vessels. They also can disrupt tight junctions, which is going to, to, to help with the process of infection. And very, very importantly, 
they play an important role in uh, interactions between different species of microorganisms in the, in the CF lung. So for instance, there are some of the alkaline loans that we know that they can induce the formation of a small coronary variants in Staphylococcus aureus that is going to make them more resilient to the, the action of antibiotics. So our main focus has been on the, the, the alkaline loans. We wanted to see whether these signal molecules that are very robust could be used as a biomarker of infection in patients with cystic fibrosis. And the reason why we selected those is because the NS and homocyte lactones, they can be lactonized by a paroxonases that you're normally going to find in infections. So our focus was in, um, in the alkylquinolones. And, uh, we embarked in a, in a study that it was originally funded by the MRC, and we had nearly 400 patients in, involved, uh, patients with cystic fibrosis. And we did a number of studies um, looking at the presence of the signal molecules, and the conclusions for a number of years of studies with those are this. So first of all, we detected alkylquinolones in sputum, in plasma, in urine, and saliva. So it was a bit surprised to us to find them in urine because we thought they would have been metabolized in the liver, but no, they were intact in, in urine. We also found that uh, the detection was highly specific and sensitive. So they were very promising as a biomarker of infection. There was also a correlation between different body fluids. So for instance, we found that the levels that we were detecting in plasma correlated with the levels that we were finding in sputum. And also, very importantly, we found these alkylquinolones in um, plasma before these patients were testing positive in microbiological assays. And then we found later that these, tests, these patients had started to test positive for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So it seems to be more sensitive than the, the standard microbiology. And the other thing as well that was very, very interesting was the fact that the alkylquinolone levels seem to be indicative of the clinical status. So when we look at patients at a stability on the left-hand side at the bottom, we found that the level of the alkylquinolones were very low. When they were at the exacerbation point, the level of the alkylquinolones were very high. Upon antibiotic treatment, the level of alkylquinolones went down. So it was really, really exciting. And then we thought, well, actually, we really need to do something about this. We need to find ways to be able to uh, use these, these alkylquinolones as a biomarker of infection. And uh, the way to do it was as an alternative to what we were using, which is mass spectrometry. We wanted to be able to design a test that could be used as a point of care test that the patients could actually use themselves at home. So we went for the generation of monoclonal antibodies that um, could be used as the diagnostic tool and they could be incorporated in a point of care device and um, then they could be validated. So what we did is we conjugated the alkylquinolones to an apton, in this case BSA. We immunized some sheep and then we did that in collaboration with the University um, of Aberdeen. We generated a phage library. We went through the typical cloning methods to, to, to get single chain antibodies. Um, and uh, we purified those single chain antibodies and then we tested them. So that was only the, the part that recognizes the antigen of the, 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 the antibody. And then we tested them for uh, the ability to recognize alkaline loans. And uh, we got a number of clones and uh, we were purifying very easily high amounts and we ran a number of ELISAs and we found that the sensitivities of these antibodies were in the low nanomolar ranges, which were uh, similar to the concentrations that we would normally find in patients. However, with the single chain antibody fragments, there was a problem and is they don't translate very well in um, point of care devices and also they can be prone to, 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 to degradation. So we decided to convert them into IgG2A. And uh, so we just follow the standard protocols to clone them into in mammalian vectors and transfect them, purify them. And then we tested them because obviously the conformation of the antibody is going to change from the, 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 the single chain to the full antibody. So to our surprise, these antibodies remain extremely sensitive 
to the alkylquinolones. And um, some of them we were even detecting uh, alkylquinolones in the picomol levels, which are the minimal levels that we normally detect in, in patients that are infected by um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And they could detect uh, separately um, two of the main alkylquinones from Pseudomonas aeruginosa, PQS and HHQ, and they did not have any a cross reactivity with a number of molecules that we tested them, especially with the NS and homocyte lactones. So, the next thing that we did is we wanted to change the matrix to a natural, more natural matrix, and we tested them in uh, urine, in synthetic body fluids of urine, plasma, and saliva, and a spike in human body fluids, um, so urine and saliva as well. And we found that they worked extremely well. So the detection levels that we're getting are in the picomolar range, which is very, very promising. Not only that, we find no correactivity with any components of these body fluids, no correactivity with um, uh, ns homocelactone, for instance, and certain antibiotics that we're looking at. And the other thing as well is we've now been testing them in uh, human samples from CF patients colonized by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And we can detect them. So, for instance, in, in that particular case, we detected, um, I'm, I'm showing the, the urine samples, which is where we detect the lowest amount of the alkylquinolones, and these antibodies can still detect them. So, this is really, really impressive. So, what have we done and where are we going to? So we, we've done, uh, we started with a, with a clinical trial with a generation of the, 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 the antibodies. The cystic fibrosis trust funding through a VIA award was extremely um, supportive because it has enabled us to um, make this antibody fragment. So we did the clinical trial first, but this has facilitated making this antibody and testing this antibody. So we're really, really grateful for the CF Trust for that. And then what we, we, we've done is we, we got Sean Robertson funded by iCure to start looking at the commercialization pathway for um, these antibodies. And uh, we are in the process of generating a deep stick assay. And uh, if it works in body fluids, we will be generating a lateral flow device. And uh, then the, the plan is to go through clinical trials, getting FDA approval. We're hoping to be able to um, spin off a company that is going to be able to support the development of this test to be taken into the clinic. And not only that, we're looking at different um, type of patients. We're not only looking at cystic fibrosis patients, but we think this test could be relevant for non ca prochiectasis, COPD patients, and also septicemia. So there are a number of people that I really need to acknowledge here. I know that quite a few of you in this audience, they've heard about Sean Robertson because he's been involved in many meetings uh, and he's been key to, to, to develop the commercialization pathway for this, this antibody. Simone Lucanto has been generating this antibody in collaboration with Somia Palegil and, and um, Andrew Porter from Aberdeen. Luisa Martinez has been involved in the supervision. Nigel Holiday did all the mass spec and then all the TTOs and of course, Helen Barr that is supporting us in all the clinical pathway of this. So that's me done. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions in the end. Um, thanks very much, Miguel. So let's bring um, Martin and Darius back up to the stage. Um, we've got Lauren's moderating the online questions and I think Laura's got a roving mic and we've got the catch box mic. I'm gonna start with a question in the room. So uh, do pop your hand up if there's something you'd like to ask one of our speakers. Come on, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll give you a moment to think. Let's see if there's any questions online. Um, Lauren, anything uh, to put to our speakers at this point? Um, so there's a question online. I think it's for Martin. Um, do your results mean we should be treating candida growth as well? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a difficult one. It's a, it's a model system. It's only got three species in. We are trying to complexify it. Uh, it's hard. Every new species that we introduce, we have to optimize a little bit more. It's becoming easier, but uh, the, the data suggests that the candida is, which is present in a lot of patients, so there's a lot of 16S analysis that's done, but that only detects um, prokaryotes. 
what you need to do is 18S analysis, as, as, as we've heard earlier. And, uh, and it turns out that candida is quite common. It's found in an awful lot of patients, but it's down there in the dust. So um, it might be really important. Yeah, shall I, shall I comment on that as well as a mycologist? So, yeah, I mean, it, it's incredibly prevalent in cystic fibrosis, candida in the airway, and historically we've kind of ignored it. Um, but there, are, there have been two significant papers recently. One was David Corey's group in the States who showed that candida can drive fungal asthma, essentially. So that was a very interesting paper. So something of worthy um, study for the future. And there was another paper that showed that gut candida can actually be, there's cross-presentation of candidal antigens that can then exacerbate the aspergillus allergic phenotype. So uh, it may be that we need to pay more attention to, to candida. Yeah, we, we actually find that candida titers are very sensitive to the specific strain and mutant of Pseudomonas that we put in there. So it, it seems to be an exquisitely sensitive indicator of other things going on in the airways. Perhaps if I could add to, to, to this discussion, and uh, is the fact that you've got that candida is going to be affecting very much the relationship with other organisms. So for instance, candida can inhibit the, the, the production of some of the, the, the virulence factors produced by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So if you treat candida, what is going to happen to Pseudomonas aeruginosa? And that is one of the key questions in CF. You've got to be very careful when you're treating a particular organism because you don't know if you're breaking the balance, whether the consequences may be worse. Thank you for that. I see a hand up. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to head, head it to Steve. Professor Floto again because he did such a good job last time. Steve's ready to catch it and then it's going back over that way. Do you want to wave again? The person that had their hand up. Oh okay. okay it may take a couple of passes. Oh, it's been dropped. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, gosh, it does work. <laughs> um, just a, a question about quorum uh, sense and molecules. Uh, do they differ between um, uh, Pseudomonas, which has formed a biofilm, and Pseudomonas, which is just newly colonized on, a, on an airway? Would you expect to find different quorum sensing molecules? And, and is it the same one that you're t using in the, in the model that you've got? The molecules will be produced by um, both the earlier colonizer and uh, the later colonizer. The levels would obviously be different because the more pseudomonas you have, the, 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 the uh, more of the, the, the molecules you're going to get, right? But the molecules will be, will be pretty much the same, um, the same molecules. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions online, Lauren? Yeah, I, I kind of related to that question. Um, there's a question, if the urine test is positive, how could you differentiate if the pseudomonas is in the lung or another part of the body? We couldn't, in a sense. I mean, if it's, if it's present in urine, you know that this, this particular individual is going to have pseudomonas, pseudomonas infection. Now, whether it's in, the, in, in another part of the urine, the, the, the body actually got into the bloodstream and then into the, 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 the urine, we wouldn't be able to differentiate. Okay. Other questions from the room? Oh, just down here at the front. So, Laura, feel free to run or just throw the catch box. <laughs> <laughs> just going from one. We should have two. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Okay. My question's for Miguel. Um, I was wondering when you selected the AQs to be um, the, a compound that you chose to follow up, was there any other compounds initially and you narrowed it down to that or was that uh, you started off with that idea to begin with? Sorry, I don't, I'm not sure I'm following what you mean. So when you chose to follow AQs as yes. uh, the compound, was, did you have other uh, compounds initially and you narrowed it down as that was the most popular oh, yes, one? Yes, yes, we did. Okay. Uh, um, uh, and I, as I said before, the, 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 uh, when we started the, the, the clinical trial, when we were looking for biomarkers, we were very interested in, in the, 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 um, the two families of quorum sensing molecules. We were interested in the, the ns alpha-mosylolactones and the alkylquinolones. And we wanted to see which ones we, we could detect. 
However, what we found is that in general, it was difficult in, in some of these patients to detect um, reliable levels of the NSL homocinolactones. And uh, as, as I was mentioning before, the main reason was because uh, peroxonases are going to break the, 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 the homocinolactone ring of the NSL homocinolactones to, to be able to detect them by mass spectrometry. It was very difficult. That's why, because the alkalquinolones were quite robust, we decided to, to go for those as a biomarker of infection. Thank you. Um, questions from our online audience, Lauren? Kind of related as well. Um, what are the advantages between the antibodies you presented in terms of for alkylquinolones um, compared to already existing antibodies, say, against other virulence factors, elastase and exotoxin and things like that? Right. We've, we've not followed those ones, right? And... Um, the, the, the thing, um, in, in our case, we're not, we're not using the, the, we're detecting the antigen, right? We're not detecting the, the, the antibody, right? So uh, to, if you want to get body fluids, if you want to get them, uh, you want to, to, detect, to, to, to get into urine samples, for instance, you're not going to be detecting elastase there, right? And that's why with the, with the alkylquinolones, they will get everywhere. So we're not detecting, the, the, using to, to follow the antibody, we're detecting the antigen in this case. Great, thank you. Um, uh, we've got time for another question from our audience in the room, so show your hand if you've got a question for our speakers. Okay, I'm not, oh, I'm seeing a hand there. Do you want to chuck it in that direction? <laughs> your turn. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Ooh. Oh. <laughs> nice, nice save. No, no water spill. Uh, so just on the quorum sensing molecules, do you think there's a load of bacteria that you're going to need to have before you sort of threshold and get this that's detectable? Or do you think that the, the sensitivity that you're seeing is going to be low enough that it'll kick in? Well, the only thing I can tell you is the, the, the example that uh, I was mentioning before and the fact that uh, when the microbiology was negative, we were detecting in some patients the presence of the, the, the quarantine sensitive molecule. So in a sense, it's telling you that even from the very beginning, you're able to detect these molecules. Thank you. Okay, um, we've got a couple more minutes. So um, Lauren, any further questions come through online? I have a question. Um, there's Go one ahead. Online. Um, in terms of, uh, you mentioned Martin, um, the CF lung being a particularly um, or beneficial environment, or I don't know how to term it, but Pseudomonas likes the CF lung. Have you seen any effects in the era of CFTR modulators in terms of any changes to the environment of the lung and any downstream effects um, in terms of Pseudomonas metabolism? We haven't looked. It's a very good question. And one of the problematic things that uh, I think Jane alluded to earlier is the fact that people aren't expectorating so much sputum these days on modulators. Uh, it's a really good question. It's what, something that we've really wanted to have a look at for a long time now. Okay, thank you. Um, final question from the room. I think we've got time for just one more, if anyone does have one. No? Okay. I think that's probably a good place to draw a line then. So thank you very much, Martin, Miguel and Darius. <laughs> So we're doing another round of um, flash poster presentations. So um, people are going to start lining up along the side of the stage. Um, like before, the first one is online. So um, Raul Bhattacharya is, should we, we should be connected with him now. Everyone else, if you can line up in order next to the stage. So if you're the next one to speak, you can just stand by that door there. Um, after Rahul is finished, the second presenter will come straight up. They'll introduce themselves. We'll then follow on through like we did before. And as before, they'll only um, have a, you'll only hear from me if I have to interject if they go over there three minutes. So um, Rahul, uh, is, are we ready to go? Can you hear me, Rahul? Are you happy to, to go yeah. ahead? Great, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I am Rahul Bhattacharya from the University of Minnesota, and we are working on the role of CFTR as a tumor suppressor in the mouse and uh, organoid models of CF-associated colorectal cancer. 
And we know that the CFTR gene, it acts as a tumor suppressor in colorectal cancer. And the CF patients, they have a much higher risk of developing colon cancer. And the patients with low expression of CFTR, they have a poor overall survival. So we are working on two objectives, which I will describe one by one. So first, I will talk about objective four, which is to confirm the efficacy of calcium channel inhibitors in uh, uh, reducing tumor formation in CF-associated CRC mouse models. So for this, uh, next slide, please. So for this objective, we are using the intestinal tumor susceptible APC min mouse where the CFTR gene is knocked out with the use of the intestine specific villain Cree transgene. And in this mouse, uh, the particular exon, exon 10, is basically excised or deleted, which results in functional inhibition of CFTR. Now, uh, so uh, these mice, they are treated with the calcium channel inhibitor verapamil at a dose of one milligram per ml, which is mixed with their drinking water. And they are treated until four months when these mice are basically sacrificed, the intestinal tissues are harvested, fixed, and the tumors are scored. So this study is comprised of 12 study classes. That is three genotypes, CFTR wild type, knockout, and heterozygotes, and two genders. And there are two groups treated, treated with verapamil or not treated. So, and this study is divided into two cohorts. The reason I will explain shortly. And so far, we have worked on cohort one, where we have 246 mice of which 97 have been treated with verapamil and 149 are untreated. And so far, we have observed that verapamil was able to significantly reduce the small intestinal tumors in case of the CFTR wild-type female bulbs. We did not observe significant reduction in case of the colon samples from these mice. Now, historically, the survival of CFTR knockout pups are very low because of the high mucus buildup. And however, recently we observed there is a steady increase in their survival. And upon looking at the DNA, intestinal DNA from these mice, we found there was no functional excision of exon 10 in these mice. So when we investigated the probable problems, we Invest, check the uh, LOXP sites, which was totally intact. And then we started breeding with Raul, a new I'm, villain. I'm sorry, that's your three minutes. I, you'll have to wrap up very quickly and I'm bringing the next person on. Okay, uh, so currently we are uh, generating the new cohort of mice and we are also working on, uh, next slide please. Another objective to demonstrate the mechanisms for by which CFTR is acting as a tumor suppressor. And so far, we have identified that CFTR basically modulates the growth of the colon tissue, as we found increased growth in the CFTR knockout colon uh, uh, tissues as well as organoids. And currently, we are generating more samples for doing the RNA-seq analysis uh, immunohistochemistry, as well as the DNA analysis, followed by functional testing using organoids to get a detailed mechanistic insight into how CFTR basically acts as a tumor suppressor in colon cancer. Okay, Raul, we'll Thank have to you. cut you off there. Thank you very much. So let's bring on the next speaker. <laughs> Yehi, over to you. Hi everyone, my name's Iha. I'm a PhD student from Imperial College London, and my project focuses on deep immunoprofiling of aspergillus bronchitis and allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis in cystic fibrosis. So a bit of background on the project. Um, in the air we breathe, there are many airborne spores or chlamydia. Um, it, it's produced by the saprotrophic fungus aspergillus fumigatus. 
And in a healthy individual, the breathed-in cornelia are effectively cleared by the immune system, but in people with CF, the cornelia can result in aspergillus bronchitis or allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. <laughs> so AB is an aspergillus infection in the airways, causing a chronic inflammation without a hypersensitized response. So because of, because of that, it's thought to be mainly driven by T helper 1 cells, um, whereas ABPA is a chronic inflammation driven by the hypersensitized response um, to aspergillus allergens, therefore is thought to be mainly driven by T helper 2 cells. So both conditions are currently poorly managed clinically with um, varied patient responses to treatment. So the idea of um, further understanding the pathobiological mechanisms behind the disease can help us further categorize the patients and treat them accordingly. So this is known as endotyping, which has been previously done in conditions like asthma. So here we hypothesize that the deep immunological profiling will reveal distinct um, immunopathological endotypes in AB and ABPA within the CF cohort. So um, this project will be split into like three aspects. So firstly, we have already established a multi-centered patient biobank for the terrific study. Um, from which we have stored the samples to carry out our further investigations. So the immunophenotyping will be in two aspects. So a spectral flow cytometry analysis of the patient PBMC and a um, proteomic study of the uh, patient's sputum and pla or plasma. So the spectral flow panel consists of um, 25 antibodies, which allow us to define the population of T helper cell subsite, um, T regs, and some B cells. Uh, the proteomic study will be carried out by um, LCMS um, to identify differentially expressed proteins. And by correlating the two findings um, of the two assays, we hope to identify some distinct endotypes uh, within AB and ABPA. So thank you for listening. Um, if you're interested, come and check out my poster. Hi. Yep. So I'm Tom, author from Imperial, and I'm going to apologize that this is probably going to be quite repetitive of what Darius showed in his talk already. Um, so yeah, we work on Aspergillus fumigatus, the saprotic fungi, and as he here mentioned, that we all inhale a couple hundred of these spores every day. Due to their really small size of two to three microns, they easily reach the lower respiratory tract. And now we know that there's a bunch of predisposing factors for developing aspergillosis, and I'm sure as everyone here knows, one of them is cystic fibrosis. As Darius mentioned earlier, aspergillus disease can kind of be scaled on depending on the intensity of the immune response, whereas at the far side here, we have the intense immune response where we get our hypersensitivity and allergy with our bronco, um, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and our fungal asthmas. In the middle, we have our aspergilloma, aspergillomas and colonization, and then at the deficient end, you have your invasive disease. So obviously, in the context of cystic fibrosis, we've been focusing on the hypersensitivity and allergy. So, yeah, this isn't going in order. Um, traditional models of allergy have been generated by doing intraperitoneal injections of lysates or live fungus um, over two weeks, followed by an acute dose, uh, which is quite high, of about 10 million canidia. And you can imagine this isn't how people are exposed to in the everyday world. So what we opted to use instead was a model set up by David Corey, in which you use low doses of fungus in about the range of 200,000 every day for two to three weeks instead. And you can actually do this dose, this um, protocol down to about 25,000 spores and still getting mild allergy response, so you can try and titrate it down. Um, 24 hours later, we then do a bronchoalveolar lavage and histology, and what you can see is, although these mice are they're immunocompetent, they don't lose any weight or die off, but when you start to look into their lungs, you can see that there's um, inflammatory infiltrates, as well as inflammation and restriction of the airways and mucus production, like I showed earlier. And we did a time course of the immune cell compartment over the two weeks at 3, 7, and 14 days. And you can see that the eosinophils build up over time, whereas you have a constant influx of neutrophils. And interestingly, by the 14 days when you have all this eosinophilia, you actually get a dropout of the alveolar macrophages. And then you have increases in your adaptive compartment with your T cells and B cells. Now, this, um, in, this is also associated with increased lactate dehydrogenase at, um, 14 days, which is a marker of cell death, as long as um, inflammatory IL-1 beta and the neutrophil chemotractant CXCL1. So when we put this into um, 
cystic fibrosis mice, you can see that they actually do lose a significant amount of weight compared to both their PBS-treated and wild-type controls, although the histology with in, um, infiltrates and um, mucus production looks quite similar. The eosinophil numbers don't change, but there is a significant influx in the number of neutrophils as well as T cells. Um, and although LDH doesn't change, there's more IL-1, beta, and CXCL1 giving you this um, hyperinflammatory phenotype you'd expect in CF. So what we're now working on is um, identifying some immunothera novel immunotherapeutic targets, which Darius touched on a little bit. And if you want to know more, you can come talk to me on my poster, which is freebie. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Michaela. I'm uh, a third year PhD student under Jane Davies looking at staph and pseudomonas co infections. So we know that pseudomonas and staph are two major CF pathogens and they have this inverse pattern of infection. We can see here on this graph from the CF Trust that staph aureus is more common in children, but pseudomonas becomes the more dominant species into adulthood. This led to an initial focus on competition between the two species but there is increasing evidence that they can coexist. And one third of people with CF are co-infected in the UK, so it's quite an important interaction to study. And we had the hypothesis that given the increased tolerance required for sustained coexistence, is co-infection associated with less severe respiratory health outcomes? Uh, to answer this question, I used a 21-year retrospective data set, so that took the CF uh, registry data from 2000 to 2021, and that was the demographic data and clinical outcomes. And I merged this with all the microbiology data that was provided to the Royal Brompton Clinical Lab, and this was so that we could get a really accurate picture of chronicity. So that was to calculate uh, chronicity based on the LEADS criteria, and we categorised individuals into chronic, positive, or negative. And we looked at the outcomes on um, the effects on two different outcomes, FEV1 and IV days, and we used estimated marginal means analysis. So you can see on the x-axis increasing pseudomonas severity, and on the y-axis the change in FEV1. And uh, you can see staph in different colours here. So when a staph is absent, you can see a significant decrease in FEV1 as pseudomonas infection worsens. Uh, you can see a similar trend when staph is present in a positive manner. However, you can see here that when staph is present in a co-infection in a chronic manner, there is no significant difference in uh, changes in FEV1 as pseudomonas infection worsens. And a similar trend for IV days. So there's a small significant increase in IV days as pseudomonas worsens from negative to positive for all staph infection types. But then when pseudomonas becomes chronic, you can see that when staph is negative or positive, there's a really significant increase in IV days, but that is lacking in uh, co-chronic infected patients. So here we can see that chronic pseudomonas is not associated with worsened health outcomes in the presence of chronic staph. And uh, I'd like to thank all of my colleagues and co-authors and the funders. Thank you very much. Hello. So my name is Livia, and I'm going to talk about what I did during my PhD funded by the CF Trust, which was focused mostly on pseudomonas originals and infections and trying to find inflammatory biomarkers and protective mechanisms. Uh, during, I mean, in the poster, I'm just presenting a sneak peek of the work I did during my PhD that was mainly focused on this compound called lipochlorous acid, uh, or HOCL, that's a key weapon against evading path pathogens, but it seems to be affected in its presence by the absence of CFDR in CF patients. What I did during my PhD was trying to answer this question. So how does pseudomonas aeruginosa so response to HSCL and what changes in clinical isolates uh, if they, to see if they show a difference in their response. Uh, we use a different range of, ranges of methods to identify um, in, in biomarkers to actually study the HSCL uh, response in pseudomonas, and we use the, um, this, uh, these biomarkers to um, build a profile of clinical isolates and also try to understand if there's a difference between early and chronic clinical isolates, so for different st stages of infection. And the main finding, the main finding uh, that I'm presenting in my poster 3D is that chronic isolates actually show greater sensitivity to HOCL, probably due to the fact that there's less HOCL, the 
there's, that's just the hypothesis we, we have due to the lack of CFTR. But in terms of at molecular level, we don't really see uh, a difference between the two um, early and chronic um, isolates, so for different stages of infections. But if you're interested in to know more, just come and chat with me. Hi, so my name is Bjarke. I'm presenting part of the work from my PhD at the Technical University of Denmark uh, entitled Evolution of Metabolism in Pseudomonas Urginosa During Adaptation to the Cystic Fibrosis Airways. So when Pseudomonas first colonizes the CF airways, it undergoes rapid adaptation in the first two to three years where it transitions from sort of a naive phenotype to a persistent phenotype that's much harder to eradicate. And uh, interestingly, this phenotype is not characterized by increased antibiotic resistance, which comes much later in chronic infections, but rather it's characterized by changes in phenotypes such as growth rate, biofilm formation, virulence uh, factors, and metabolic specialization, which help the bacteria evade exposure to an eradication by the immune system. So my project is specifically focused on the metabolic specialization that occurs and if that directly leads to persistence with the hope of identifying potential targets for novel therapeutics and biomarkers aimed at persistent infections. So the way I went about this was to select out from a larger longitudinal collection of clinical isolates from people with CF, select out early stage infection isolates and late stage infection isolates um, using reduced growth rate as a proxy for metabolic specialization and analyzing those by metabolomics and proteomics to see what, first of all, what are the changes uh, in metabolism and what are the convergent patterns between different infection scenarios. So I looked at eight different infection scenarios. Um, and across those, interestingly, one of the major drivers of metabolic specialization were these mutations in pyruvate dehydrogenase, which Martin mentioned earlier. And um, when we uh, insert those into um, a laboratory strain, we can actually, um, yeah, we study those, that by metabolomics and proteomics and see that it partially recapitulates the persistent phenotype of the late clinical isolates. And we also tested them directly in an air-liquid interface model that simulates uh, the, uh, the, the airway infection. And we find, sorry, we find a, um, a reduced pathogenicity and reduced immunogenicity of the bacteria. So these are some examples of the results you'll see on my poster, which I don't have time to go into. Uh, welcome to come by. But the, um, the conclusion is that these mutations, they recapitulate the persistent phenotype uh, and help suppress the immune system. And in fact, it looks like when you also look at the literature on extracellular pyruvate and its role in regulating the host immune system, it looks like this could be a commonly used mechanism for Pseudomonas aeruginosa to coordinate both um, bacterial physiology and host immune cell physiology to help uh, evasion of the immune system in the early stages of infection. And uh, yeah, this could happen long before development of antibiotic resistance. So it's a very important mechanism to look into and target in the future. Thank you. So thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm Melly, and I'm mostly working from Hanover, actually, but that's uh, another story, as Susanna has three locations, just because one wasn't enough. Um, and I want to present most of my PhD topic, which is the extensive metabolic profiling of 414 clinical isolates of pseudomonas from different origins um, that revealed the significance of specific amino acids in virulence and in motility. And for this, I think for now, I will just try to briefly introduce you into the yeah, experimental setup we used. Um, those 414 clinical isolates, and now this is an advertisement, uh, are very well characterized for several different phenotypes that are infection relevant um, for the genome, proteome, transcriptome, and you can all find that if you Google Bactome if you're interested. And um, what we did was uh, utilize the Gen3 microplates from Biolog which are composed of different substrates, as you can see on the slides. 
um, of various sources, um, as well as some chemical sensitivity assays, and this might seem redundant, you've seen all of those plates before. Um, and then we generated an in-house pipeline for analysis of several respiratory um, parameters to further look into several different patterns, um, including the metabolism and correlation to several different phenotypes, as well as the genome and transcriptome. And just to give you a small sneak peek, this is a, a heat map showing the unique metabolic footprint for each of those 414 clinical isolates. So on the, let's say, x-axis, you see each compound tested, and on the y, uh, no, other one. Y-axis, you see each compound tested, and on the X-axis, all um, 414 isolates. And this was quite intriguing for starting, and if you're interested in all the correlations we found, specifically for motility and virulence in dependence of um, the metabolic activity on specific compounds, please come. Uh, I will skip this stuff because of time reasons, sorry, and come see my poster, 3F, that slide wasn't included, thanks. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom. Uh, I'm a second-year PhD student, um, and my project is titled um, Novel Models for the Study of Host Pathogen and Drug Interactions in Cystic Fibrosis Lung Infections. So my project is part of uh, PipeCF, which is an SRC designed to develop a standardized preclinical pipeline for the development of novel CF antimicrobials. Um, specifically to my project, we are critically evaluating and optimizing host pathogen models that accurately recapitulate core aspects of the host environment. Um, the evaluation of these models will be based on their representation of relevant host and pathogen markers in the context of Pseudomonas aeruginosa infection. So there's a range of models we can choose from, like in vitro and also in vivo models. Um, in the in vitro models, we're looking at cell culture-based models where we can add... Um, biofilms of Pseudomonas in a relevant sputum mimic media to, to get that CF aspect recapitulated, um, and we can use other variations as well. Um, and then in terms of in vivo models, we're looking at the use of Galeria, which provide a really valuable uh, pre-screen to, to mouse models. You can see here um, some example data that I've shown here where we've infected with PAO1 uh, and tried treating with tropomycin. You get a nice dose response using this. So we hope that, that being able to test in Galeria will um, reduce the amount of mice that we use further along in the pipeline. Um, and then later on, we'll get to optimizing different mouse models as well of, of infection. Um, so once we've optimized these models, how are we going to validate them? So we already have, uh, we've identified a set of clinical biomarkers that are associated with resolution of pulmonary exacerbation. And it will be these biomarkers that we use to evaluate um, all of these models um, as predictors of, of clinical success. Um, our future perspectives involve us optimizing and benchmarking this set of models to mimic key components of the CF environment, um, to benchmark these models with existing antibiotics, um, and in the end to develop a, a set of robust, scalable, and reproducible preclinical models that represent key factors of the host environment. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm a second year PhD student from the University of Cardiff and my PhD focuses on testing novel therapeutics against Bulgaria multiple runs. So everyone in the room probably has heard of Bulgaria in the past, uh, but the interesting part of my PhD is I focus on the good aspect and the bad. So the good aspect is all linked to the production of specialised metabolites, um, two of the ones that are really known as the pacin, which is a potential biopesticide that protects germinating pea crops from uh, damping of disease, which is called bipithium, and then NSOxin 2A, which is the antibiotic that I focus on in my poster, uh, which is produced by two different species of Bogodera that is active against Bogodera multiprons. But here, everyone in the room is probably more familiar with the bad Bogodera. Uh, so multiple species of it are known uh, along Bacillin and CF. So they represent at the minute about 5% of all CF infections, which is not many compared to sodium and that we heard before, but they're quite dangerous infections to get. Um, the reason I focus on Bogdara multivirons is if you look at the graph, it shows kind of a, si a switch from Bogdara senior species in the late 1990s to Bogdara multivirons now, which is the main Bogdara species that you find in CF lungs. And it's not been as studied as extensively as senior species because it's not as dangerous or as lethal, but it still needs to be looked at because obviously it is the dominant one the minute. Bogdara is also 
multi-drug resistance, they can produce toxin, as is the case of Bocchiaroclegioli. Um, and then, as I found out recently, it can also cause, is the main cause of onion rot. Um, so if you have any onion, onion that are rotten, it's probably Clegioli in them. But in terms of the interesting mechanism of drug resistance, it's quite a lot in Bocchiaroclegioli, I won't go into details, but they cover a lot of antibiotics that we have at the minute, so that's why we need new ones specifically to treat multivorans. So these are some of the questions that I focus on in my posters. So the first one is, how do you extract nesolexinate 2A? Because it's not a commercially available antibiotic, so you need to be able to extract it and purify it in the lab, so then we can try it. And then I focused on comparing it to uh, meropenem and trimethoprim, which are commonly used antibiotics to treat bulky infections, uh, to see if it's actually worth putting it into more clinical trials and pre-development uh, trials. And then the last one uh, that I focused on, which has been really interesting and I've spent my whole summer working on, is kind of in the context of CF-related diabetes, how can high blood sugar levels actually impact the susceptibility of Bocadera to different antibiotics? If you're interested in that, my poster is still up on 3.8. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our speakers and, and great job with the flash post presentations there.